Imagine if Nexium, the infamous cult run by Keith Rainier, was run by women and claimed to focus on women's health. That is in essence, the concept of one taste. They allege that through the process of orgasmic meditation, you can finally reach that sense of unfilled hunger in your life. Yet those close to one taste say, all this company is reaching for is your vulnerabilities, your devotion, and most of all, your wallet. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about one taste. Please note that this entire episode will be discussing sexuality. So this might get graphic at times. That's your heads up, the whole thing. For years, foretaste wasn't much more than the topic in the Cult Education Institute forums. When it was talked about in other articles, it seemed taboo. They were the weird cult that believed in orgasmic meditation, a technique that many referred to as simple mutual masturbation. Others seemed to insist it was enlightening and so much more than just touching each other, but a way to connect. Some speculated about the founder, Nicole Dayton, and her partner, Reese Jones. He was a notable Silicon Valley venture capitalist who donated money to Wikipedia, and yet allegedly had his name blacklisted from their platform. Taglines for these strange orgasmic meditation seminars read, you can't see Hendrix anymore because he's dead, so you gotta see Nicole stroke pussy. Some paid thousands upon thousands to see as many classes as possible. Some called it BDSME, while other users said it was just Reese Jones's social experiment or a way for him to access younger women. Going through the forums, the wild conspiracies and theories about it are abound. People seem frustrated by the lack of information. Why weren't journalists reporting on this? Pages and pages of personal investigations tried to get to the bottom of this in 2014, 10 years after this company was founded. How did they hide for so long, especially when they made $12 million a year near their peak? And who exactly is One Taste? Though we'll dive into when One Taste was founded in just a moment, it's important to give a little bit of background here first. So let's rewind the clock back to the 1970s when orgasmic meditation, the crux of one taste was first born. Victor Barenko held what was billed as the first public demonstration of a woman orgasming, which was reached through an oddly specific and clinical fashion. Barenko would stimulate a woman's clit, sometimes for hours for an audience while he was fully clothed and she was on a gynecological table. In theory, it doesn't sound like the worst idea out there, even if it's not how we're used to seeing conversations around sex be demonstrated or performed. I've mentioned before that sex education is important and especially surrounding women's anatomy, and it's usually pretty lacking. However, as Mel Magazine so eloquently put it, Barenko saw the clit as a button for profit. One 1994 article entitled The University of Sex says that Barenko's followers had called his methods responsible hedonism, and they'd often pay hundreds, if not tens of thousands of dollars to learn his methods. The article claimed that 11 courses were designed by Barenko, who described the mutual stimulation program as making friends with another crotch. One two week program, the expansion of sexual potential cost about $16,000, which by today's dollars is over 30 grand. Yet it gets even stranger from here. Barenko ran communes called Morehouse or Morehouse communes. He calls himself a love guru and turned his lucrative classes into a gateway for his sex cults. At his climax around the 1970s, Barenko was even called the Colonel Sanders of the commune scene. And he had about 160 people living between 16 houses he'd restored, all of them paying a $200 a month residence fee. Some of the exercises he taught were just literal masturbation. Some called him nothing more than a hustler who didn't actually teach anything. And some say that Barenko just had young women giving him hand jobs in the name of spiritual healing and dedicated members building his fortune by fixing up more Victorian homes for him to sell or potentially turn into other communes. One of their locations, the Lafayette Moore House, presents itself as a loving community and an ongoing lifestyle research on pleasurable group living. They finish by saying, where fun is the goal and love is the way seemingly not stressing just how much of their program is about sex or based on sensual teachings. And this doesn't even begin to touch upon their controversies regarding drug use, of course. Regarding how you feel about Barenko and his teachings, one woman and former student of Barenko's named Nicole Daydon was inspired by him. She decided to rebrand them in 2004 and founded the cult we're talking about today, One Taste.
When Nicole Daydun found One Taste, she claimed it was because a monk at a Buddhist gathering suggested he try this orgasmic meditation ritual on her. Mel Magazine says Nicole was a former student of Barranco's, Complex tells the monk story. So it's entirely possible she was influenced by both of these people. Regardless, she told other communities that while she thought the monk was creepy at first, she allowed him to perform the ritual on her and she felt a universal connection because of it. Not only did the man touch her, but he also described her vaginal region, was patient with her, and showed Nicole a new way to see and experience orgasm. It reminds me heavily of when this happened in the most recent Goop documentary. Nicole said, quote, "'This is the feeling behind all the machinations of sexuality. This is why people are willing to risk their own lives and risk STIs and risk their marriages and risk their sanity.'" Nicole pursued this feeling, claiming that this ritual gave her a heightened sense of awareness and that she could read people's emotions, even in mundane situations like the grocery store checkout. A Buddhist teacher told her that she had a Kundali opening as a result of the orgasmic meditation and Nicole vowed to share this with the world. In her mind, Nicole was doing something good. Now, while I generally don't want to speak too much about people's intentions as we can't possibly read their minds and know for sure, it does seem as if Nicole really did believe she was doing a good deed in these early years. Now, me, however, being a pessimist, and I recently saw some charts somewhere on the internet. I know this is, this is great, very factual moment. I'm gonna just throw in my garbage opinion here. But I saw this thing on the internet that said that straight women in straight relationships are the least satisfied, like sexually, person. So I I just wonder, I'm like, did you like, I don't know, were you only with like straight men? Like, did you try the other side? Like, it's kind of nice over there too, you know? So I don't know, that's just my thoughts. Anyway, soon in 2009, she began getting attention. The New York Times wrote an article called The Pleasure Principle that featured Nicole and put her in a positive light, a leader of the slow sex movement that focuses on women's pleasure. At that time, she had a core following of about 38 people and their morning practices were open to residents only. The New York Times explained that at 7 a.m. each day, about a dozen of these women, naked from the waist down, lie with eyes closed in a velvet curtained room while clothed men huddle over them, stroking them in a ritual known as orgasmic meditation, oming for short. The couples who may or may not be romantically involved call one another research partners. During the practice, couples can't even make eye contact, making it strangely clinical, yet perhaps spiritual too. And of course, just to insert my own opinion here again, this isn't um, remotely similar to what actual sex research is like at all. There's no actual researchers present as far as I have found, but anyway. As for the monk at the party or former Barranco student story, the New York Times reported that her mentor was actually Ray Vetterlein, who had been inspired by Lafayette Morehouse, one of the communities Barranco founded. At the time, One Taste was said to be just a stop on the sexual underground that was weaving together strands of radical individual freedom, Eastern spirituality, and feminism. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that at all. And if that's where it ends, maybe we wouldn't be talking about One Taste today. Their message seemed to resonate with a lot of people at the time, and more prospective students found One Taste as Nicole gained credibility and as they watched her 2011 TED Talk. Although it's now enlisted, you can still find the TED Talk online and hear how Nicole introduces people to orgasmic meditation and her beliefs. She starts off by saying she's devoted over 10,000 hours to this practice and that orgasms are necessary for every single woman on the planet. Now, some people on the asexual spectrum that may not want that would disagree, but I do agree that sex education and understanding of our bodies is important. So let's continue, but not forget that there are some asexual folks out there and that this can also be a little bit uh, disillusioned or maybe ostracizing for those folks. However, the most important part of this to Nicole is that quote, it roots our fundamental capacity for connection. It's here that Nicole's phrasing starts raising some red flags for me, as she says that just as the ocean has one taste, the taste of salt, so does the taste of truth and liberation. Though this truth and liberation wasn't popular at first and the business was on the verge of collapse, the New York Times in that 2009 article is what truly kickstarted one taste. Fundamentally, Nicole claims that everyone said the same thing. Some version of I'm hungry and there's a gnawing sense of hunger I can't reach. Each time, Nicole gave them the same answer, orgasm. When the man at the party touched her for those 15 minutes, Nicole said she had finally had access to that sense of hunger in her life. And she wanted other people to be able to have access to it too. It isn't just mutual masturbation. Nicole says it's a way to access that hopeless feeling that you won't be reached deep inside. Many people can relate to Nicole's words, whether they care about a good sex life or not. 
She's talking about needing a sense of connection, a sense of fulfillment, feelings that I'm sure many of you can relate to. Nicole presents orgasm as the cure, as a way to change the world even. And theoretically, who wouldn't want that? Other articles and sources began picking up on her story, her community, and pretty soon, the idea of orgasmic meditation wasn't so strange and unpopular anymore. A few short years later, after Nicole's TED Talk, Refinery29 posted an article about oming written by Laura Barcella. Laura said that orgasmic meditation became a phrase she heard with glossy eyed praise from seeking lost soul types. Yet for a while, orgasmic meditation remained pretty vague about their practices, aside from the gloved 15 minute touching bit. But when Laura explored a little bit further, she learned that you could become a certified coach for $15,000, complete a mastery program for $7,500, attend a conference for $195 to $395, or go on one of their relatively cheap turn on events for just $10. Laura spoke to people that swore by the practice, such as Joanna Van Vleck, who even worked for One Taste for several months before she tried oming herself. Once Joanna tried it, she claimed to become an overall nicer person and described her former self as kind of itchy. Joanna eventually went on to become OM's CEO. Even former members like Audrey Steele had good things to say about One Taste. I've always been a person who craved really authentic experiences, people being real. I found that here, Steele said. All in all, Refinery29's article was largely positive. They helped bring one taste back to the headlines once again and interviewed people that called orgasmic meditation a healing experience, a place of pleasure and not shame, and their communities inspiring. There were just a few red flags though, like the fact that these inspiring healing experiences don't come cheap. One former member, Jen, left after becoming disillusioned by all the marketing practices and $15,000 courses. The practice itself is an awesome tool when it's done respectfully, but one taste the company I have a problem with, they said. Despite this criticism, as well as the connection this article makes to Barranco's controversial communes, Refinery29 doesn't give much evidence to back up the claims that one taste was a for-profit cult-like system. They acknowledge those accusations were floating around at the time, but they seem to be classified as a matter of opinion. And one taste was painted as simply having a devoted fan base. The author of the article finished off by saying that the company doesn't seem to fit the traditional definition of a cult from where they stand. No one they spoke to had super negative orgasmic meditation experiences, and they listed a variety of One Taste locations at the bottom. Around the same time, another article from The Atlantic was released, taking a similar view to Nicole's practices and calling her movement the orgasm revival. They too emphasize how important climax is and claim that at a One Taste conference, it was prescribed as the cure to all ailments. The Atlantic also takes note to explain that the practice is 90% feeling and just 10% technique, as well as far more complicated than formerly believed. Marissa Gerson, the author of the article, also says that she was a convert by day three at the conference. It made her open and loving and weird and alive, she claims. The benefit to this method seemed clear, and the idea of orgasmic meditation itself was, at this point, highly acclaimed. Yet, as we've heard, it's not so much these practices that I or anyone else seemingly for the matter took real issue with, but with One Taste itself. The more popular One Taste became, the more questionable stories arose. Refinery29 claimed in their article that they couldn't find anyone with a horribly negative experience at One Taste. And it's true that actual reputable information about One Taste was pretty scarce. My source list for this episode has been a fair bit smaller than usual. However, somewhat questionable experiences definitely existed if you knew where to look for them. In 2013, Natasha Tiku investigated One Taste on its rise to the top. She explained that at these OMX conferences, about 1400 people would attend, paying about 200 to $400 for tickets. Seemed Nicole definitely wasn't struggling anymore. During the workshops, Nicole continued to preach therapeutic results from orgasmic meditation. And it was taught as a body hack to happiness that some declared, quote, should be required education for every man on the planet. But to Nicole, it was so much more than just a workshop. Oming had become a way of life, seeking to certify businesses as OM based. Even businesses like coffee shops, yoga studios, banks, legal offices, businesses that we might think have no place for this kind of space. And this is for me where Nicole kind of starts to lose me a bit. Regardless of how you individually feel about Oming, it's important to recognize that this isn't gonna click or work with anyone. And some people are gonna be really, really uncomfortable with this. Like saying you're gonna OM on a plane, like I just think that's deeply inappropriate. 
It feels like Nicole is so caught up in spreading her message that she doesn't seem to realize that not everyone would like to receive it. And that's something that is kind of a big deal when it comes to cults, religious beliefs, that kind of stuff is some people get so excited to spread the message that they forget that some people do not want to receive the message. And if they don't wanna receive it and you push it on them, you become the asshole. Still, Oming seemed to become more and more legitimate. Foundation futurist Ray Kurzweil, who works with Nicole's venture capitalist, on again, off again partner, Reese Jones, declared Oming a technology, claiming that they are based on scientific knowledge about physiology and psychology. The men that had mastered the Oming craft were given the titles of master strokers. And <laughs> God, sometimes I can't believe the shit I have to say. <laughs> they were given the titles of master strokers. And centers began cropping up in London, LA, Austin, Las Vegas, San Diego, Boulder, and Philadelphia, giving OM an even greater sense of legitimacy. Yet Natasha and Rick A. Ross Institute, an online forum about cult education, remained skeptical. And I feel like every time we bring up Rick Ross, we gotta talk about it. It was not Rick Ross the rapper, not the huh guy, but the just the researcher guy. Sorry to both Rick Rosses for that. Now, the deeper that they dug into Nicole's past, they found she'd taken just three classes with Barranco, but worked closely with one of Barranco's students we mentioned earlier. So why tell the cocktail friendly anecdote as Natasha put it? It seemed like Nicole was trying to tell the world that it's something she discovered free of Barranco's controversies at a party. Like Oming is a secret passed on at Buddhism parties and she's this heroic figure bringing this to the Western women that she claims so desperately need it. Natasha says that while at the conference, she did see a few lesbian couples and questions and exercises that asked people, what do you want over and over, breaking down the walls of the participants and having them be honest with their interviewers. One of the speakers, Clyde, that describes sex as a drug that sells itself, also had experience in Landmark Forum, another company we've discussed on the channel that has been known to have some cultish undertones in its messaging. Clyde stated that both businesses are similar in, quote, finding language that releases the inhibitions you have. And already that does raise some very massive red flags for me, but let's move on. After all the claims and the presentations came the demonstration. The way Natasha describes it, the demonstration comes across as extremely odd and even a bit creepy. She says that Nicole strummed the one taste member she was doing the OM on and lowered her head towards her crotch as if hearing some mystical hum. Nicole told the audience that quote, there was a moment when it feels like my whole entire body was at a low, deep, expansive, vibrating hum that just kept moving out. But even though Natasha seemed to be a skeptic, she tried it. By the end, she claimed that in the right hands, Oming was a hell of a good time. While she states that she didn't climax the first time, she did experience a rush of oxytocin and speculates that that's what many women experience during these demonstrations, an oxytocin overload. And so with the desire to get to the bottom of one taste, as well as a firsthand experience of what they do, Natasha finally interviewed Nicole herself. She learned that Nicole's father had been to prison for molesting girls when Nicole was in her twenties and was estranged from him. His death from cancer not long after is what propelled her into theosophical studies, then Buddhism, then celibacy, and then finally orgasmic meditation. One taste was Nicole's way of quote, going into the belly of the beast and begin to heal this trauma about misused sexuality. Nicole herself acknowledges that it was her trauma with her father, her darkest spot that became her purpose. And Natasha claims that many others attending those classes have been through their own similar dark spots as well. Towards the end of the article, there was a small questionable piece of information though. Natasha said that once she began asking questions and was no longer just attending the class, those that once seemed so warm and welcoming seemed cold. Other former members have said the same, alleging that they were pressured into buying more classes because of that isolated frozen out feeling. It seems like once you enter the One Taste community, leaving can be a bit difficult. And for a while, that was it. That was just about everything anyone knew about One Taste. It was considered a fringe yet harmless group that the co-founder claimed was truly world changing. Natasha explained that participants could stop the OM exercise at any time if they just wanted to hold up a red flag. Everyone seemed close and vulnerable with one another at conferences and events yet there were no red flags being held up during demonstrations for, or for the most part, in many outsiders' minds either. It was just an unusual little quirky group. It wasn't until Bloomberg's article made headlines that this changed. And before we get into some of the concerns that finally arose from One Taste, let's take a quick moment to place today's sponsors. For many people, getting financially healthy means dropping the weight of credit card debt, but where do you start when it feels like a never ending cycle? 
If you have multiple credit card balances every single month and are only paying the minimums, you're barely making a dent in your credit card debt, which can be really discouraging. Upstart can help you pay off your existing debt quickly so you can finally feel like you're getting ahead. And it's not just credit cards. If you're consolidating high interest debts, funding a personal expense, maybe using it to start up a new business, over a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a very clear payoff date. And Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score. So rather than just looking at your score alone, Upstart models can look at other factors like your income, employment, and other information that you provide in your loan application to find you a smarter rate for the loan that you need. And you can check your rate online without impacting your credit score in just five minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com casket. That's upstart.com casket. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know that we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit score, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Today's episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. I love being able to shop online while in my PJs, but I'm terrible at keeping track of promo codes and who has time for that? But now I have Honey to help find those precious money saving codes for me. Honey is the free shopping tool that searches the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones to your cart. Now, recently I've been reducing how much I've been buying online. I've been really trying to hold back and just kind of keep it local a little bit. I don't know, I'm just trying a new thing for right now. It's a new year's resolution. It's probably gonna fail, but I'm trying anyway. But I've used Honey to help purchase furniture for the house when I needed a new rug from a furniture store. It's even helped me buy some supplies for the candle making business and of course clothing. So they're literally everywhere. And now Honey just doesn't work on your desktop alone. It also works on your iPhone. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on amazing savings. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I'd never recommend something I don't use. And I've been using Honey for years. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com casket. That's joinhoney.com casket. One Taste paid a six-figure out-of-court settlement in 2015 to a former employee that claimed she suffered sexual assault and harassment. Yet it wasn't until 2018 that One Taste was exposed in Bloomberg's article, The Dark Side of the Orgasmic Meditation Company. This lengthy article by Ellen Hewitt went into disturbing detail about all the behind the scenes issues the company had been hiding from the public. The women featured most in the article is Mikal, a former member that told Ellen her upsetting story. According to Mikal, she was drawn to One Taste because she felt unfulfilled and the group seemed glowing, attractive, confident, and seemed to hold the key to sexual and spiritual enlightenment. Mikal felt welcomed, maybe even love bombed, and she began working on the One Taste sales staff. It started small. She was an employee at first, but she moved into a communal house in Brooklyn with her coworkers. She quit her teaching job to be a part of One Taste instead. And when she didn't have enough money for their coaching classes, one of the higher ups helped her apply for a new credit card. Her parents tried to warn her, but Mikal had never been in debt. She didn't understand it, didn't listen, and was so swept up in the excitement that she didn't seem to care about anything else either. Soon, One Taste members weren't just her colleagues, but her roommates, her closest friends, and even her sexual partners, with one later becoming her husband. Even though she only made $200 to $300 per month since she was an independent contractor instead of an employee, she spent more than 80 hours a week working on their activities. She constantly had to be turned on, seemingly their term for ready to sell, and if that wasn't the case, higher-ups would demand to know why. Outsiders were asleep, muggles, or in the matrix, and it was her job to wake them up. What an incredible, thrilling privilege that is, right? Now, while you might think that those closest to a cult might be able to see better in, you know, the, see the forest for the trees, so to speak, this doesn't seem to be the case at all. In all the cults or cult-like communities we've discussed before, it's the people closest to the leader that seem to be the most disillusioned. This isn't to say that lesser members aren't hurt, but in this case, it seems like the company itself was toxic more so than their average OM practices and attendees that we've heard from in previous articles. People devoted their entire lives to One Taste and Mikau was one of them. It's also exceedingly infuriating that this employee was paid so ridiculously little, barely anything. She was very vulnerable to them, seeking acceptance, and they seemed to take advantage of her needs to the fullest extent. Mikal didn't just attend the classes that cost a few hundred dollars either, but she went on the $36,000 retreat called the Nicole Daydun Intensive. She even held her wedding there. Between that and all the classes, 
Mikal and her husband found themselves in over $150,000 in debt. She told Bloomberg, the deeper I went, the more courses I did, and the more I worked for them, the closer I got to Nicole, I knew I was doing something that later would be very difficult to unravel. I knew I was losing control. In one taste, I'd done that again and again and again. It didn't start out with $500 weekend courses and thousands more for retreats though. Mikhail seemingly fell for one taste clever marketing strategies. First, they'd host a free or nearly free event with titles like Tired of Swiping Left? Let's Talk Real Intimacy or You Do Yoga, You Meditate. Now try hashtag orgasmic meditation. These nearly free classes are just meant to get people interested in the $200 introductory classes. And eventually the price begins to rise the deeper you get, which honestly, I don't understand. If Nicole experienced this life-changing connection at a party for free, then why go on a retreat for thousands of dollars to do the same damn thing? It's not as if the technique is changing or One Taste themselves has said it's about the feeling, not the former techniques. So again, why charge so much? Well, that's where these accusations around it being greedy and taking advantage of people come into play. Nicole's top lieutenant for about a decade, Rachel Sherwitz, resigned around the time that Bloomberg began asking One Taste about their sales practices. Former staff both were charmed by her, but terrified of getting on her bad side by not hitting sales goals. She would allegedly call customers marks while referring to the sales staff as lions, tigers, or fluffers, a term from porn sets. A former salesperson explained, quote, you fluff someone to get them energetically and emotionally hard. You were the dangled bait. Like you can have more of this if you buy this $10,000 course. Apparently, One Taste would even tell people that money was just an emotional obstacle for them to overcome in this path to enlightenment. The most damning piece of evidence to prove this misdeed is the fact is that Joanna, the CEO herself told Bloomberg, quote, we took money from people we shouldn't have, acknowledging that they encouraged people to take out multiple credit cards or even sign up to crowdsourcing sites just to take their classes. One former attendee who I am gonna struggle saying their name and I apologize for this, but Ruan Mikpagala was 24 years old when he went to a One Taste event in 2012. He ended up working for the company for two years, yet he left owing them money, $30,000 to be exact. Women sales staff would allegedly even offer sex or attention if someone paid for their courses. However, Ruwan himself teaches pickup artist S classes, showing men how to, as his site says, access their primal unconscious selves. So he's not really to be a trusted moral authority within the community either. Please note for this next section, we are going to briefly discuss sexual and physical abuse. I ask that you skip ahead if you're not in the place to hear this. Now, even so, Mikal and Ruan aren't alone in thinking that One Taste was extremely greedy, but it gets far worse than greed. Ellen writes that some former staff and members have lobbied even more serious claims against One Taste, saying that they resemble a kind of prostitution ring that exploits trauma victims and others that search for healing. Some claim that the company purposefully hired salespeople willing to flirt and lure emotionally vulnerable targets. Others said that managers frequently ordered staffers to have sex or ohm with each other or with customers. Few members claim they were ordered to do something they didn't want to, but many more say they were pressured or cornered, leaving their cases in more of a gray area. One Taste has vehemently denied any of this, but as the Bloomberg article goes on, it reveals more information about that six-figure settlement. Aries Blanc is apparently the woman that sued and later settled with One Taste. And according to those familiar with the case, it was for these exact same reasons, being ordered to sleep with customers and managers. However, since Blanc hasn't commented on it, we can't confirm or deny this. In addition to sexual assault, former staffers also claimed that domestic violence was prevalent within One Taste. One executive allegedly slapped his girlfriend repeatedly at the company's headquarters in 2014 and was fired, then rehired because of their belief in rehabilitation. Between this and the debt that plagues those close to them, Mikal has said that One Taste truly is a cult and they're deserving of the full weight of that label. Others say they're not just a cult, but a religion. The higher ups were like priests and priestesses of orgasm. Nicole herself even called them that. A former member says orgasm was God and Nicole was like Jesus or Muhammad, implying that some sense of worship towards Nicole and her practices. While media sources have referred to them in such a loving or teasing matter, Mikal says they are truly an organization that really preys on people's weaknesses. And when she left, she lost everyone, her friends, those that had been so welcoming to her and even attended her wedding. She lost an entire community. While being frozen out is saddening enough, 
A 53-year-old private nurse, Lori, said it was so much more than that for her. In a way, it was like stopping therapy. Trauma related to her childhood sexual abuse had resurfaced during that time frame, So this meant leaving so much support she had found behind. She claimed, quote, I was afraid of losing my soul if I left. This sounds so dramatic, but in my vulnerable state, I believed it. I thought I would be fucked spiritually. Again, this kind of dependency is one we've seen frequently with cults in the past. They convince people to rely on them. And regardless of how helpful you believe OM practices might be, they were clearly financially harmful to some extent. Not only did they create dependency, but in some cases, they told people anything and everything they wanted to hear. Hamza Tib was in one taste for nearly one decade, and he felt tied down by his young son born while he was still in college. Nicole, who is not a licensed therapist as far as I know, told Tabe that his mother's choice to keep the child should not impact his own choices and absolved him of responsibility towards his son. This potentially checks off another item on the cult checklist here. Do they separate you from friends and family? In this case, it sure seems that way. Still, One Taste has insisted that they're just an edgy lifestyle community that became a business around 2016, and in 2017, they made over $12 million in revenue. As for people depending on them, they claim that they hired a trauma advisor in late 2016. Not that this helps anyone that experienced this dependency before then. It sure seems that they didn't think this one through. They do claim to have never told people to leave their families or responsibilities behind, and even told Bloomberg in 2018 that while they don't organize group OMs anymore, they still have serious expansion plans and they've begun gaining a few other questionable endorsements. CrossFit advisors, Khloe Kardashian and Tim Ferriss, the author of The 4-Hour Body, are among a few of them. So you can see that the bar is literally underground at this point. Joanna claimed that the National Hockey League was even interested, but the NHL apparently have no record of a conversation. She not only insisted that One Taste was the Whole Foods of sexuality, which feels extremely strange and off-putting already, but began pushing them into other spaces as well. OM had principles apart from orgasms, like treating the disease of sexual harassment and talking with companies about the hashtag MeToo movement. But there have been cracks showing, whether One Taste will admit to it or not. Nicole stepped down from her CEO position in 2017 for Joanna to take over, and she even sold her stake in the company. Since then, it does seem as if their liabilities have lessened and they're certainly making less headlines, but that doesn't really change the damage that's already been done. Not in the eyes of their victims and not in the eyes of the law either. A little while after Bloomberg released the article, they also announced that the FBI themselves began a probe on one taste. The FBI has not spoken out and confirmed or denied the existence of such a probe, but multiple people associated with one taste have claimed to be interviewed by the FBI. It seems like the concern here may be using sex for sales, but some say it's too soon to tell, and it's only speculation. As for the speculation around Reese Jones, I can't confirm his role in the company aside from possibly being involved as an investor. And some say his name isn't in Wikipedia because he wants it that way, hence the donations. All in all, it does seem like this was primarily Nicole's doing, hence the focus being on her. And I don't wanna delve too deeply into just theories alone. I am of course really curious to see if anything does come of this and if any more information is revealed. One taste might just die out and fade into obscurity and just a few dozen people in an apartment like it was before. Or maybe it's far worse than we ever imagined and we'll hear a full picture one day. Personally, I hope we are gonna hear the full story, but I hope it doesn't get much worse than here obviously, because to know that more people are gonna be hurt potentially when the story comes to light, it, it's never a positive. Like it's great that the whole story comes out, but it's sad because you know so many more people suffered. But with all of that being said, as just my opinion, my thoughts on today's episode about One Taste. Thank you so much for being here today and tuning into today's episode. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I really appreciate your time here as per usual, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye. 